Hey everyone, I'm Ryan Howitzer and you have just entered Hypertime. Today, we're talking Spider-Man. Spider-Man was created in 1962 by Stan Lee and Steve Ditko. If I have to tell you anything beyond that about the character, you're watching the wrong YouTube channel. Spider-Man has been one of the most enduring icons of the 20th century, and part of that is due to his fallibility. See, Spider-Man isn't like Batman or Superman, or even Thor or Captain America. He's not perfect. He's a teenager, he screws up, he makes poor decisions, and he has to balance being a superhero with being a teenager and having a job. In other words, he's the perfectly relatable superhero. The other thing that makes Spider-Man so popular is his rogues gallery. Spider-Man has gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with the likes of Green Goblin, Dr. Octopus, Mysterio, Kraven the Hunter, and many other villains that people recognize. With Spider-Man being one of Marvel's flagship heroes, it's pretty obvious that there have been several attempts to make Spider-Man movies. The attempt we're going to be talking about today was from 1991 or 1992, and it's helmed by none other than James Cameron. Now keep in mind, in 1991, James Cameron was THE big name in Hollywood. He'd already made Rambo First Blood Part Two, Aliens, and he'd just had a huge success on his hands with Terminator 2. So this was huge. Now James Cameron didn't actually write a script for this movie. What he did write was a very detailed plot synopsis. So that's what I read and that's the information that I'll be giving to you today. The film opens with Spider-Man hanging from the World Trade Center. This is actually the framing device of the movie. Periodically it cuts back to Spider-Man hanging from the World Trade Center, telling you the story. It's a little bit strange, but it does work for this movie. He launches into his origin story, which is the bulk of this movie. And that's not necessarily to the film's detriment. After all, this was 1991. We'd never seen an on-screen Spider-Man adaptation before, so an origin story was expected. This film portrays Peter Parker in typical fashion. He's a geek and an outsider from a low-income part of town. However, this movie really hammers home that Peter is an outcast by making him the only low-income kid at a rich high school. Mary Jane Watson is also a student at this high school, despite the fact that in comics at this time, the two of them didn't meet until Peter was in college. You know, Ultimate Spider-Man didn't even exist at this time. Can Brian Michael Bendis' writing just travel back in time and inspire other Spider-Man works? It's pretty much your paint-by-number Spider-Man origin story, though. Peter Parker goes to a science demonstration of some variety or another. He gets bitten by a radioactive spider. He has this weird Kafka-esque transformation and then finds out he has powers. He then tries to use those powers to gain money. Uncle Ben gives him the with great power speech. Uncle Ben gets killed. Spider-Man tracks down the killer, and then Spider-Man decides to use his powers for good. Initially, Cameron wanted Dr. Octopus to be the main villain of this movie. And we'll get into some of the weirdness around that when we get to the speculative casting. But instead, he opted for two very different versions of two classic Spider-Man villains those being Electro and the Sandman. Instead of being Max Dillon, this time Electro is billionaire Carlton Strand, who believes that he is superior to everybody just because he has superpowers. Sandman is a guy named Boyd, who was a janitor at some kind of nuclear test facility when there was suddenly a problem and he became Living Sand. Why that same story couldn't have been with Flint Marco, I have no idea. This Spider-Man movie had kind of a 90s edge to it. Spider-Man was a lot more violent than he's typically portrayed as being. There was also quite a few swear words and a lot of sex in the movie as well. After reading this, I've come to the conclusion that this movie would have been cheesy and filled with 90s cliches. James Cameron's a pretty good filmmaker, but some of his movies do tend towards the cliché, especially movies like Titanic and Avatar. Also, I really don't think the world was ready for a Spider-Man movie with lots of sex and lots of swearing. Now let's go into speculative casting. This time we actually have some of Cameron's choices for who he wanted in this movie, and uh, we've got some doozies today, folks. There was never actually a full script for this movie, so there's not an actual cast. However, James Cameron did have a few people in mind for the movie. 
He wanted Leonardo DiCaprio to play Spider-Man, which, I'm going to be really honest, that's a horrible choice. DiCaprio does not strike me as the Peter Parker type. Also, back when the villain was supposed to be Dr. Octopus, he wanted Arnold Schwarzenegger to play him. You can use your hindsight goggles and determine that would have been an absolute train wreck. Stan Lee had also expressed interest in playing J. Jonah Jameson, which... It wouldn't really have worked, but it would have been hilarious to watch. My personal choices for J. Jonah Jameson always have been, and always will be, Sam Elliott and Arlie Ermey. Now, for Mary Jane Watson, right around this time, I would have gone with Jennifer Love Hewitt or Tiffany Thiessen. Both with lots and lots of red hair dye, of course. For Aunt May and Uncle Ben, I'm gonna have to stick with the Sam Raimi casting. Cliff Robertson and Rosemary Harris did a great job in their roles, and I think that they would have done great in this movie as well. For Spider-Man, I'm gonna have to go with an unknown actor. I just can't see any of the well-known teenage 90s actors pulling off this role, DiCaprio included. Despite the very cliche-heavy script, this movie had some major league talent attached to it. I mean, this was James Cameron fresh off of Terminator 2. How on earth could this thing not have been made? This movie ultimately didn't see the light of day because of legal reasons. Carolco Pictures, the group making the movie, had the production rights, but they didn't have the broadcast or home video distribution rights. So they sued for those. 20th Century Fox sued Carolco Pictures because they thought they had exclusive rights to James Cameron's services as a director. It didn't help matters that in 1996, Marvel filed for bankruptcy. So what happened to the script? Well, a lot of it was actually cannibalized and put into the Sam Raimi Spider-Man movie. There are literally moments of the film and lines of the film that were taken straight from this script and put straight into the Sam Raimi movie. And this would have been your typical 90s blockbuster action movie, but with Spider-Man in it. It wouldn't have been horrible. It wouldn't have been great, though. Maybe it would have been better than the Sam Raimi movies. I, I really can't tell. Well, that's all for now, true believers. Next time we enter the many branching paths of hypertime, we'll be looking at Batman Beyond. I'm Ryan Howitzer, and I'll see you next time.